I can look at someone's farm and I can diagnose an issue and I can um, you know, do lots of things, but there is always, you know, you've got to remember that this number is just a data, you know, a piece of data, and it isn't the real world. So you've got to always think, you know, okay, this, cat, this farm is ruminating at 450 minutes. That's either because they're going fantastically well or because they're feeding 6 kgs of straw. You know, so those two differentials, you've always got to think of that real world. So what we do um, in our practice is we start with a starting point of making sure that their proposed diet is hitting at least 90%. So in our practice, we've built just an energy calculator. It's pretty, it's pretty basic in the back end. All we're saying is they need to eat uh, X amount of energy um, for a, say, 500 kg animal. Um, their current diet would hit 90%, bang. Um, we also, in the back of this spreadsheet, just to show you what our package is, um, we also include on the right side of the spreadsheet, you can put in your springer numbers, and then it will change your allocation or area on a daily basis. Because what we consistently found was people will tell you that they're feeding six of grass and four of baleage and two of straw, and that's what we feed every day. And then they, they take 30 cows out that calf, add another 50, and they still feed the same amount of area. You know, so we wanted them to be able to change that area um, on a routine basis. Okay, so that's the background. So we want um, springers ruminating in our area about 450 minutes. Um, for um, majority of ours, that would be six, oh, about uh, 10 of green, two of straw. <coughs> Um, so then how do you monitor it? So um, has everyone seen the elite packages? No? Nodding? Yeah, yeah. So um, the elite packages, and we'll show you them more at the end, and we'll show them as you go through. But Amanda, <laughs> who's Amanda? Way at the back, if you want um, to talk about them and get training in the elite packages, this is the easy way for you as a vet, I think, to interface with these systems. So. This one here would be the first one that you see. So this is the rumination page. And we've chucked on here a special tab um, here, which is the daily rumination of any dry cow that's on your platform. So um, for the majority of our South Island herds, we would winter off, winter off platforms. So most of our cows would go away. And then we would, they would only come back as a dry cow onto the platform when they are a springer. So pretty much all of our dries are springers. If you, um, if you have your, or how many would you have most of your cows winter on platform? Classic North Islanders. Um, so if you do that, then there's, a, there's another way you can do that with using group movement. So you'd chuck your springers into a group and you'd monitor it via your daily rumination up in this left hand corner. But here, um, this, special, this one that we've created on the elite portals, um, just allows you to see for our South Island herds without any group movements what your average um, daily rumination of your springer mob is and then you can use that as your daily summary. So who thinks that they could now monitor a springer? Can you count to 450 minutes? Could you look at it and say oh you're only sitting at 300 and give them some advice to improve? <laughs> Is it, is it that scary? I promise it's not. So, yeah, and I guess the key is, I mean, there's a few, you do have rumination tabs on your normal portals and on the Sense Hub, so if you, if you don't have the elite portals, you can still do that. But, yeah, essentially, it is that simple. It's just, you know, having a target figure in mind, maybe double-checking that the energy levels will match up um, is a bit good step, but, you know, it really is that simple. Right, so then we go into transition rumination. Um, so the, the, um, this one probably many of you have seen before. So this was our, uh, back in the day, we, uh, our first year we were conveniently had um, a few farms with, or well, quite a few farms with collars on at that point, but um, we'd had Sue Mackey come to us as a nutritionist. We were collaborating Rico. Um, and she, she taught to a lot of our guys about this um, once a day in the classroom period. So and we had a mixture of people. So we had some who were in that grey line who were doing once a day for the whole period. 
uh, this was a twice a day herd and this was um, a mixture where he was doing some at two days, some three days, some four days, some five days back into the back. And then this was the graph when we broke out that orange farm who created a huge amount of uh, man-made variance in rumination in the first seven days. Um, and we could see that if we split out that, that spread, we actually had a 10% spread in, um, in the in-cut frayed at six weeks. And we then followed that through with uh, benchmarking across our practice in terms of what was the pre-mate heat, um, how many of your cows had had a pre-mate heat, I think this was about two or three weeks pre-mating oh, pre from August carvers. And you can see there was this huge variation. Overall, our once-a-day herds were better. But what, what this was the real um, sparking point for me was we had some once-a-day herds doing okay, you know, pretty well. But down here, we equally had plenty of once-a-day herds who were doing poorly. So once a day by itself wasn't, wasn't the only answer for our herds. You know, there, were, there had to be further things that were making successful transition. And that's what we'll talk about. Um, so I guess the first thing that we start with is, I guess, what's achievable um, in our systems. Now, you might have to build your own uh, case examples for your practices because, you know, in our, far in our farming system, this would be almost universally um, achievable. Like our, our farming systems are fairly similar. We've got irrigated land. Um, pretty much everyone will have to feed some form of silage at that time of the year. There'll be some grass going in and there might be some supplement in the shed. So this kind of re recovery rate is quite achievable. Talking to some of the North Islanders, you might have to lower these levels if you're on, say, fully grass only, but we'll, we'll talk about that fully grass only soon too. So um, from our last our season's benchmarking, this was what our upper quartile of farms were, were achieving. So they were hitting day zero rumination rates of 325 minutes, getting up into the 400s by day one, and then basically just accelerating from there. So it is actually really quite achievable to hit the ground running by having good spring and rumination rates, climb up and go well. So how do you monitor it? So this, this is my favourite report ever, ever on the whole system. And Steph at the back built it, so thank you very much, Steph. Um, so this is a transition rumination report. So this is available in the Elite packages. And basically what this does is it, it cuts down every cow in the herd um, on a single day point. So today for our herds, we might have up to 50 cows calve in a day sometimes. So we get some pretty big numbers in here. But it will have, say, there's 14 cows that calved one day ago, 12 cows that uh, calved two days ago, and so on down here. And we can see what their daily rumination rate is as they go down. And so you're basically recreating uh, this curve in real time. And the great thing about that is, A, you're getting instant feedback on how the farm is performing and whether they're achieving your targets. But the second thing is that it is hugely responsive to change. So you, because you get a new set of day one cows tomorrow, if you screwed up day one tomorrow and you make some changes, within one or two days, you've got a f completely fresh set of cows coming through under your new management decisions, and you'll get to see whether that management response worked. So you're getting instantaneous feedback. You don't even, you don't even have to make good advice anymore because if you make bad advice, you can change it in two days because you get you know, good feedback straight away. Um, to make it work, it's critical that carvings are entered on the day. Um, so, I guess monitoring that and how you would utilise it. So, um, I guess Rico talked about he was going on to people's dashboards and offering offering it as a service, and I think that's um, that's a really cool idea, especially if you can create that model as you talked about and charge for it. Um, I think in the early days, there's huge opportunities to get on farm. I know it's a busy time of year, but um, getting on farm, seeing it in real life, because I think all of you will be quite comfortable in talking to farmers and seeing real cows and seeing what's happened and maybe seeing that, you know, colostrum mob is hugely tight or something like that and make some real life dis um, changes rather than just going on, you know, data and saying, you're performing poorly, fix it. You know, getting on farm is a huge opportunity. 
So this is the once a day portal. So in this system here, we've still got the transition rumination at the top. Um, down the bottom, we've got all cows calved less than, say, in our, in our herds, most of our uh, once a day herds would do 10 days on once a day. So they'd sit in this box down here until they're ready. And then at that point, they'd jump up into these two boxes. So either the one on the right here means they've recovered, they've hit our rumination parameters targets that we've seen in the background, uh, which I think is about 380 minutes at least, and 360 minutes for a seven day average. So if they reach that, they jump up into that box. Our guys in the South Island um, like everything automated, so they will automatically have a draft on those every morning and chuck them into the twice a day mob. Um, but over here you can see cows that didn't make the grade. So if you're collecting a heap of cows over here on the left box that haven't made the grade, so you know you're, you're only hitting say 50% going in the right way, you know you've got some massive changes you need to make at some point in that timeline. Down here, uh, this is cows that have calved over 30 days that are still once in a, uh, on once a day. Um, and you can change that number. And Amanda gives you training on how to change all these numbers as well on the elite portals. Then over here, um, once you've got them in a twice a day mob, the same thing happens. You can see, right, how many cows are suffering once you're over there. And um, yeah, this, is, this kind of one comes in handy when... Um, so you've got underfeeding in this mob or, you know, or say bullying with heifers or splitting mobs or something like that. Um, then the twice a day one is very similar. So you've got, we just split out your heifers and mixed age cows um, separately because we could. And then we just split in 10 day boxes. So first 10 days, second 10 days, third 10 days and so on. And they're either low or high ruminators. So if you're if you're past that day 10 and you've still got a heap of low ruminators, you need to make some changes. So I think this farm in question um, was feeding about three or four kgs of straw in their colostrum mob. Didn't go well. Right, so that is a quick rundown on where you'd look. And so the, the actual looking in the, in the system, if, if you load these elite portals, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can look at your spring rumination. You can look at your tra transition graph to see, you know, what's the speed of recovery? Is it going well? As long as you've got some targets in mind, it's pretty easy to say yes or no. You can look at these boxes to say, oh, we're not reaching, or we are reaching. So you can pretty easily walk into anyone's um, shed within probably 30 seconds or, or a minute. You've probably got a, you could have a pretty good idea on whether their farm is performing well or not. And then you can go and actually make some management changes. So it's, re it's really, well, I, I think, pretty straightforward. So, but then I guess you want to have the confidence of what can you do. So one of the good things about having lots of farms doing it is that we've been playing with these reports for two years now. And here are the, I guess, the five key key time periods or key things that we've found that make the biggest difference. So these would be the ones that would be your chuck in your back pocket for your go-to moves when you're doing this consulting and pull them out to have a think. Right, so the first one is that, that day zero is critical. Um, so, I mean, we've already talked about the springers. I think the springers are probably the most critical in this and to get your day zero, but also people who put them on to yard for three hours and feed them concrete don't go too well uh, don't leave them in a tight springer mob for too long um, so if you if you are if you're feeding your springers very tight and then you're only drafting once a day it's a double whammy so you're freshly cows freshly carved cows and then getting no grass as well as tight springers so it's cumulative I think um, and on farms where you can't solve it the calcium boluses do a great job of launching the rumination and appetite straight away which I think is this one here. So this, um, this is a farm that was uh, consistently actually having down cows in this period. We chucked calcium boluses in at day zero. They immediately started hitting 330s in the rumination and um, in much better recovery lines. Second one is around, I guess, avoiding grazing below 1800 or 1800 or more probably. So we've all probably had it drilled into us around that colostrum period. 
that you know the the way I think about it is cows in that period don't want to naturally eat so everything you're trying to do is to promote them or make it easy for them or make make them want to eat um so yeah it, it's it, this was you universal any farm that we had that tried to eat um, down to 1600 and it was usually on places where they were worried about second round quality um, often they'd had like downer cow issues before so they didn't want to bring springers as cleanup mobs because they were getting downers in those so they were um, yeah it was a real mess but if they tried to hit 1600 it didn't work um, so I'd definitely look at using other stock classes so here's here's an example of a farm that did it so um, they were hitting 1600 um, so you see on day zero not too bad because their springers weren't they were feeding the springers pretty well um, but um, it was just a really slow climb up to I think what was it about day four or five until they hit their peak but you know on day they never really climbed so if you looked at those ones earlier they were almost straight lines up and getting into that 400 400 plus and probably the real I, I think um, health alerts are really cool to get involved with, but any time you've got massive amounts of health alerts, it's always feeding. So you have to fix your feeding, I, I find, fix your feeding first, get your health alerts to a, a manageable level, and then it's really cool to go in and do health alert visits and, and set up decision trees for them. But yeah, this farm's sitting at 57% of the herd, and again, over three days on average, so that's really high. Uh, second one is around allocating enough feed so um, and this was so common so colostrum cow numbers apparently change on a daily basis but the allocation doesn't seem to so I think having a system on the farm to ensure the meter squared grows with the cow numbers is really important and uh, yeah residual grass is required in your calculation um, there's a surprising amount of staff members who use zero so you know if you're grazing 3,100 down to zero, there's not 3,100 kgs of grass available. Um, and within that allocation, it doesn't appear you can get adequate volume into cows from our systems, at least, with grass only. So the, the farms that tried to do it with grass only, even with constant movements, just they didn't seem to voluntarily eat as much. It'd be interesting to see if some of the North Island farms can, can get that better. I guess our grass that we're eating in spring is often frosted, not not that great quality. Um, and yeah. So this is an example farm where we've looked at it over two years. So in the first year, this is an example. He he really struggled to feed them. He was only hitting two hundreds in his room, in his um, colostrum mob. He tried once a day. He tried um, t yeah once a day, twice a day. When we went out, it just seemed like a straight allocation issue. He just wasn't giving them enough feed. Year two, he's come out of the gate, so still a bit low on um, day zero, and that was a springer issue. Um, but then he's, and these are little jerseys, so still not probably exactly where I want them, still probably not hitting that 450, but he's almost doubled his rumination rate in that period, or, you know, 100, 150 more. His cows look like their little jersey herd which we don't see many of down our way so they're quite unique but um they're looking fantastic this year body condition is amazing and in terms of pre-mate cycling rates um he's had a uh, overall at the herd level a 12 percent increase in cycling rate by week, week minus one so it's been some really big lifts and for him um i think when you look at farmer motivations one of the things that got him to actually kind of make these improvements and changes is he's really competitive with his brother and last year he finally beat him in his repro for the first time in about five years and now he's on a roll and he wants to keep it up so um, he only had to put 50 seeders in and his brother put in I think it was lots <laughs> 280 <laughs> which, which he's telling everyone about um, so the fourth thing is offering multiple feeding opportunities. So um, the most successful farms had three or more feed offerings. So usually, and, and again, when you look at consultancy, like you don't have to have all the answers because as um, Rico was saying earlier, the farmers 
all you have to do is usually point out, look, on day four, you've got this massive drop. What could be going on? And they're like, oh, well, we normally do this and this and this and this. And do you think that could be making a difference? And then you go, hmm, yeah, I think maybe, maybe we give that a try. Um, and again, this is, you know, that we didn't, we didn't come up with this. This was farmers' feedback was, uh, we had two farms. Um, one, the farm owner was running or the farm manager was running. And he was getting beaten by his um, staff down on the other shed and it was irking him. And he went and found out and just how it worked is they would give one break in the morning, one break in the afternoon, and then they'd always feed their silage in the middle of the day. And just that allocation of three separate feedings worked. And then he did it on his farm and guess what? It worked. <laughs> so just those extra motivations to eat in that period when they're not, they don't seem to be motivated to eat make a big difference. And I think within that, it's really driven home when you look at 24-hour grazing models in this period. So we've got heaps of people that use 24-hour grazing late season, and it seems to work fantastically, especially with heifers. Um, but here's an example farm where the, the only change we made between these two periods was he was trying to do 24-hour breaks. We just couldn't get... So these uh, yellows are basically moderate, red are really low, and green are kind of in the area we want them. And this is day zero, one out to 10 days. So, you know, on day zero still wasn't quite what we wanted. But um, as we went on, you know, he just really couldn't reach those in that first period. Changed them over to, to at least twice a day movement, sort of the issue. So, yeah, 24 hour grazing doesn't seem to work. Um, then the final one, which I don't have a graph for, but was um, the lime flower. So we could fix farms who were allocating enough feed but just didn't have enough calcium going in. So most of our guys would give, say, 250 grams of lime flour in that colostrum period. Um, and, yeah, if you put it up to that and they were allocating enough feed, they would suddenly rock it up. So it's um, good. Um, and so this, this next part isn't so much about the transition, but... This is just to give you an idea of what, what we're then doing in the next one and some of the opportunities that you could look at. So the next thing that we looked at was, right, we've got them through that transition phase, but when we were looking retrospectively, and if we go back to this slide here, you know, we, we got through the transition phase, some had gone well, some hadn't, but, you know, when we looked at this... Um, Historically, we saw that, you know, we still had, you know, our best herd, which was a once a day Jersey mob, was hitting, say, 92% of their herd had cycled one week out from mating. Um, but we had people down here at 15%. Um, and that was uh, horrific. So, you know, there must be, once we get past the transition, there's so much, you know, there's the eight pieces of the cake or whatever they're called now within calf. Um, there's still feeding in that period post-transition. There's still everything that you're doing leading up to mating that makes a difference. There's still health. There's still all these things that are then going to play into your pre-mate cycling rates. And so what we wanted to look at was if we can monitor those um, and give people early indications um, of whether they're um, performing well. So what we did was from four weeks out from the plan start of mating, we allowed our collar clients to start a benchmarking project and so that we could tell them if their heifers, engine room and herd were going well, on target, not on target, and so they can make changes really early on. Um, and the good thing about this was that we started ages so they got some changes and it actually motivated them more to be engaged with talking about things like repro intervention and um, stuff because we were engaging as a vet clinic not just as the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff saying right you better chuck in some cedars but we were coming in much earlier at a holistic farm level and helping them out i didn't i didn't add any animations apparently so i can't show you these but these these are the elite portals which amanda will show you at some point i'm sure um if you haven't seen them but though those uh to me make your life a lot easier i can go into any system that's got the elite um, portal loaded and you can have a really good idea on whether they're going well or going poorly quite quickly um, it doesn't take much interface and you don't have to have huge amounts of 
computer literacy to get around it. Um, yeah. But the biggest thing I think, like Rico was saying before, is I mean you have to get involved now. Like people, um, you know, people talk about not having enough time, but as Austin said, like this is what the future of eating is going to look like. Um, and you can be fighting it all the way, but eventually someone's going to take that role from you if you don't take it. You know, I've talked to farm advisors, I've talked to um, nutritionists recently. They are chomping at the bit and they will take over this role if you don't want it. So jump in.